to them and you make them responsible with great urgency to implement the plan. Basis with people of special needs, particularly children. So Ireland's most successful entrepreneur, patients and entertainment provider, Digicel. Here he shares. The history of Digicel is one of the most fascinating Caribbean stories. It's the early 2000s, and the Caribbean telecommunications market is dominated by a few big players. Mobile phone coverage is spotty and unreliable, and most people can't afford the high prices of existing plans. But then, a man named Dennis O'Brien had an idea. He saw an opportunity to bring affordable and reliable mobile phone service to the Caribbean, and he founded a company called Digicel. Join us as we take you on a journey. From the beginning, Digicel was focused on innovation and customer service. They built a cutting-edge network that offered better coverage and more affordable plans than anything else on the market. But Digicel's success wasn't just about technology. They also had a deep commitment to the communities they served. They worked tirelessly to connect people in rural areas, and they set up mobile clinics to provide healthcare services, but just like most companies today, there are always dark secrets hidden under the layers that we usually can't see. Dive with us as we peeled back those layers and uncover the truth about Digicel's successes and failures. Our story starts back in Europe with Digicel's founder, Dennis O'Brien. He was born in County Cork, Ireland on April 19, 1958. He grew up in a working-class family with Mother Iris and Father Dennis O'Brien Sr., who was a successful businessman in Ireland, having made a name for himself in the catering and hospitality industry. In the 1970s, he founded O'Brien's Irish Sandwich Bar chain, which grew to become a successful franchise with outlets across Ireland and in several other countries. His mother was a well-known philanthropist who was actively involved in charitable work and social causes. From as early as age 10, Dennis showed a keen interest in business. And Saturday mornings, he and his father would travel from Dublin to the Wicklow Mountains. When they arrived, they usually spend time with a sheep farmer searching for sheep. The journey was long. It was on those long treks that Dennis would have business talks with his father. Dennis remembers when his father started his business in 1974, and how every evening during family dinners for the next six months, the family would be on the edge over the uncertainty of the future of the business. But this didn't phase Dennis. I guess he really liked the trills of operating a business, so he started asking his father questions about every aspect of his business, such as supplies, demands, products, and labor cost. Dennis O'Brien attended Belvedere College in Dublin, Ireland. So, Dennis started to visit his father's company after school. One of the many valuable lessons Dennis could recall was how his father would explain to him the freedoms that came with owning your own business and entrepreneurialism. He said, Son, you can forge not just your destiny, but the destiny of others by creating jobs. You get to choose whom you worked with and whom you report to. This sense of independence inspired Dennis, and it was then he vowed to work toward his very own empire. After completing his secondary education, he studied business and accounting at the College of Commerce in Rathmines, Dublin, now part of the Technological University of Dublin. He also completed a diploma in corporate finance at the Institute of Bankers in Ireland, a bachelor's degree in politics and history, and an MBA at Boston College in the U.S. But the truth was, Dennis wasn't really cut out for the traditional university education. In fact, he was really bad at math because he just couldn't see the relevance of trigonometry, Pythagoras' theorem, and other mathematical principles. After college, O'Brien worked at an investment bank in Dublin, then at the marketing department of the Irish National Airline, Aer Lingus. He later founded his own advertising agency, which he sold for a profit. This was just the start of Dennis's uncanny talent for spotting good business deals, as he would go on to own Communicorp, which was one of Ireland's largest and most popular radio stations at the time, ESAT Telecom, which was formed to compete with Ireland's state-run telephone company, Aircom. Dennis was successful with these companies, but could he replicate his success outside of Europe? It's the 2000s, and after finding success in Europe, 
Denny decided it was time to enlarge his territory in the world of business, so he started to observe markets outside of Europe to see where his next ambitious venture would be. Little did he know that things were about to get a lot warmer than what he was accustomed to, and we mean literally. Dennis started to brainstorm where was the next market he would expand his empire to, but he and some of his most trusted colleagues couldn't devise a plan. Then suddenly Dennis remembered a conversation he and his father had when he was younger. One of his father's businesses involved selling nutritional products all over the world, in places like Dubai, Saudi Arabia, Japan, South Korea, and even Trinidad and Tobago. That's when Dennis got the idea about bringing mobile and telecommunication services to the Caribbean. He could remember one of his many learned lessons from his father was not to be afraid of expanding in other markets. If he had a good enough product rather than being comfortable in Ireland, he should explore international markets. So, Dennis sold his company ESAT Telecom. This was a proud moment not just for Dennis but for his staff, managers and partners as they were happy about their profits. Everyone was celebrating, but a week after the celebrations, the reality struck Dennis as he no longer had an office to report to. Most of his former colleagues were still in the business at ESAT, but Dennis was not. He knew he would eventually get bored, as Dennis was accustomed to the corporate world's bustling 8 to 14 hours per day. One day, while Dennis was reading one of his customary financial magazines, he saw an ad being run by the Jamaican government inviting bids for a mobile operator. See, back then, the island only had one mobile operator at the time, so you could say they were the elephant in the room. A company that goes by the name Cable and Wireless Jamaica Limited operates under the brand name Flow. Cable and Wireless Jamaica Limited had been operating in Jamaica since 1881 and was the dominant player in the Jamaican telecommunications market. However, this wasn't good for the customers as they monopolized the market. Customers would be held to high and exorbitant prices that they would deem unreasonable, mediocre service packages and poor customer service track records. The market needed competition. So Dennis and a few of his old ESAT colleagues were willing to take the risk. So off they go to Jamaica. They set up their office in less than a week. But if Dennis thought it was smooth sailing from here, he was in for a rude awakening. There was a huge obstacle in his wake in the form of the OUR. The OUR stands for Office of Utilities Regulation and is known for being a bit of a conscientious organization. See, Jamaica had a history of monopolized utility companies with shady practices doing as they pleased with the customers paying for the consequences of those actions. The OUR was started in 1995 with the aim of regulating utility services in Jamaica, such as telecommunications, electricity, water, and sewage. They hoped to foster competitive markets for those utility companies so that there would be better prices and services for the customers. So, if Dennis was going to enter the telecommunications and mobile market of Jamaica, he would first have to impress the OUR. Dennis and co. had to be mindful of the competitors who were also poised for the bidding of the license as well. In fact, some are well-known and reputable industry heavyweights, such as Verizon Communications, Atlantic Telenetwork, or ATN, and Telecom Italia Mobile, now known as TIM. The bidding process included various stages. First bidders had to accept what is called an Expression of Interest, or EOI, which is basically a document from the OR inviting interesting companies to the bidding process. Then companies would have to go through a pre-qualification process to ensure they met the minimum requirements to participate in the bidding. Our reviewed the technical and financial capabilities of these companies. After that, the OUR issues a request for proposals or RFP to all the pre-qualified companies. This stage required the bidders to submit their detailed proposals for a license to operate a mobile telecommunications network in Jamaica and the amount allocated for their license fees. The next stage involves the OUR evaluation of the companies in the bidding process, technical capabilities, financial strength, proposed network coverage and pricing plans, 
and their ability to deliver on their commitments. The last and final stage after detailed evaluation by the OUR was awarding the license to the winner, and to some surprise, Digicel was revealed as the winner. It turns out Digicel submitted the best proposal based on the evaluation criteria, and so Dennis's expertise and experience along with his hard-working team paid off in the end. It turns out that the journey just keeps getting a lot bumpier from here on end, as after the award, Digicel had to meet a lot of obligations and conditions, such as the rollout of its network within a specified time frame and the payment of its license fees. To be fair, this was expected on their end. So, on April 23, 2001, six months after they were awarded their license, Digicel was able to start operations in Jamaica, marking a significant milestone in Jamaica's telecommunication history. To reach such an achievement, it cost Digicel an initial investment of 180 million US dollars. But what was so remarkable was the short span of time they were able to implement their infrastructures, as this was not an easy feat back in 2001. The company quickly gained market share by offering innovative services, attractive pricing plans, and superior network coverage. Within a year of its launch, Digicel had captured over 70% of Jamaica's mobile market, demonstrating the company's ability to compete effectively against established players such as cable and wireless now Flow Jamaica. This was the beginning of years of rivalry between both companies. After Digicel was able to quickly establish itself as a major player in the Jamaican telecommunications market, it quickly expanded to become a leading provider of mobile and digital services in the Caribbean, Central America, and the Pacific. Let us look deeper into how they were able to do so in such a short time and the strategies that were implemented. By expanding into these markets, Dennis's Digicel was able to leverage its experience in Jamaica and establish itself as a major player in the wider Caribbean region. After Jamaica, the next market they had their sights set on was the Cayman Islands. Digicel quickly submitted a bid with hopes of obtaining a license from the country's telecommunications regulator, the Information and Communications Technology Authority, or ICTA. The bid was successful, and Digicel was awarded a license to operate a GSM mobile network in the country. Digicel then invested heavily in building out its network infrastructure in the Cayman Islands, including installing cell towers and other equipment. It also launched a range of innovative pricing plans and services, such as per-second billing and prepaid plans, that were attractive to customers. Digicel would then move on to other markets such as Grenada, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines in 2003. In 2004, they started operations in Barbados, followed by Trinidad and Tobago in 2005. 2006 would see them expand into Haiti and Dominica, followed by Central America's Panama and El Salvador in 2008. The company's rapid expansion into these markets in just under six years was amazing, but Digicel was relentless in expanding even further. They founded a model from Jamaica's bidding that was so effective, but with each expansion, they learn more and update their strategies. Some of the new and innovative strategies were new to this side of the world. Their competitors had years of experience over them, with some of them operating well over 100 years in the region. So Digicel focused its marketing on targeting specific customer segments with tailored marketing campaigns including youth-oriented campaigns that emphasized the company's commitment to supporting local communities. Digicel was intent on knocking the competitors out of the ballpark with their aggressive marketing, but they also implemented innovative pricing plans by introducing flexible and affordable pricing, such as per-second billing and prepaid plans, that was attractive to customers who were looking for value and control over their spending. The markets were blown away as some of these rollouts were fresh and exciting. One of the facts about telecommunications operators in the region prior to Digicel was how poor their network coverage was, especially in rural areas. You could be in a city or small town with good reception, only to take a one-hour drive to a rural town, only to find yourself unreachable. Digicel set up its superior network coverage by investing heavily in building and expanding its network infrastructure 
which allowed it to offer reliable and high-quality mobile services to customers in even the most remote areas. Other industries such as fisheries, tourism, and agriculture were benefiting from the improvement. Now that Digicel acquired its network and was doing well in its marketing, the next phase would be its partnerships. They quickly formed partnerships with back-then industry heavyweights, such as BlackBerry and Nokia, to offer a wider range of services and devices to its customers. Before owning a cellular phone was seen as a luxury for the wealthy in most countries in the region, and now because of Digicel's efforts and partnerships, the average working man could afford a cell phone. These strategies put extreme pressure and the competition. Another key factor in Digicel's rapid expansion was its cutthroat approach to acquisitions, which helped strengthen its position in the mobile telecommunications industry. Some of the notable acquisitions made by Digicel include Acquiring singular wireless operations in Bermuda back in 2005, giving it a significant presence in the Bermuda mobile telecommunications market. In 2006, Digicel acquired Bouygues Telecom Caraib, which operates mobile networks in Martinique, Guadeloupe, and French Guiana. In 2011, Digicel acquired Claro Jamaica, the third largest mobile operator in Jamaica, which helped to strengthen its position as the leading mobile operator in the country. This was a rather interesting acquisition, as we will discuss in a later video. In 2012, Digicel acquired Orange Dominicana, the second largest mobile operator in the Dominican Republic, which helped to expand its operations in the Caribbean. The final and most noteworthy was Digicel's acquisition of Telecel Pacific in 2014, which operates mobile networks in Vanuatu, Samoa, and Papua New Guinea, expanding its operations into the Pacific Islands. On the surface, things really looked promising for Digicel. But what we are about to find out is that Beneath was a monster soon to break its shackles to unleash terror. Digicel has been known for carrying a significant amount of debt over the years. The company has relied on debt financing to fund its expansion and growth in the highly competitive telecommunications industry. In 2020, the company underwent a significant debt restructuring process. But what exactly is debt restructuring? Debt restructuring is a process by which a company negotiates with its creditors to change the terms of its debt agreements. This can include modifying interest rates, extending repayment periods, or reducing the total amount owed. The goal of debt restructuring is to improve a company's financial position and reduce its debt burden which can help it avoid defaulting on its loans and maintain its operations. Digicel's plans involved a reduction in its total debt by approximately $1.6 billion. The debt restructuring process involved negotiations with a wide range of creditors, including bondholders, lenders, and other financial institutions. Digicel worked closely with its advisors to develop a detailed restructuring plan that considered the company's financial position market conditions, and long-term growth prospects. As part of the debt restructuring process, Digicel had to implement several other measures to improve its financial position and reduce its debt burden. This included cost-cutting initiatives, strategic divestments, and a focus on improving operational efficiencies. The debt restructuring was necessary due to a combination of factors, including increased competition in some of Digicel's key markets, currency devaluation in certain countries, and the impact of natural disasters on its operations. Digicel worked with its creditors to restructure its debt in a way that would allow it to continue to operate and invest in its network infrastructure, while also reducing its overall debt burden. The debt restructuring was seen as a positive move for Digicel, as it allowed the company to improve its financial position and focus on long-term growth and sustainability. However, it is important to note that the telecommunications industry is highly competitive, and companies like Digicel must continue to innovate and adapt in order to remain successful. For instance, let us look at the impact of natural disasters on Haiti and the role they played in Digicel's debt. In 2010, Haiti was hit by an earthquake measuring 7.0 magnitude on the Richter scale, and its epicenter was located near the capital city of Port-au-Prince, this caused massive disruption of mobile and data service, and the entire telecommunications sector was affected from cell towers to offices and sales outlet. 
What was even more damaging was that Haiti was not able to recover as they were plagued with various natural disasters over the years. The inability of Haiti's economy to rebound did put a strain on Digicel's debt. Since entering the Haitian markets in 2006, they have invested $1 billion and failed to recoup those investments. This was the main reason why the ugly reality of debt looms over Digicel's head. If you delve deep enough into the affairs of any company, you are bound to come across controversies. Digicel does have its fair share. We will start at the head of the hierarchy with Dennis O'Brien. Dennis over the years has been riddled with controversies, but for the sake of this video, we will be focusing only on a few. For example, in 2011, Dennis O'Brien was accused of bribing a politician in Jamaica. The allegations were made by a former Jamaican government minister, Philip Paulwell, who claimed that O'Brien's telecoms company, Digicel, had paid him a bribe in return for favorable treatment in the Jamaican telecoms sector. O'Brien denied the allegations and described them as completely false and entirely without foundation. Digicel also denied any wrongdoing and stated that it operated with the highest ethical standards. To be fair, the Jamaican government did carry out investigations, but no official charges were ever filed against O'Brien as no evidence of wrongdoing was ever found. What's strange was that this was not the first time similar allegations were brought against him as Dennis O'Brien has faced accusations of having undue influence on the Irish government, particularly in relation to the awarding of contracts. Some critics have claimed that O'Brien's close relationships with government officials have enabled him to secure favorable treatment for his businesses. In 2015, O'Brien took legal action against the Irish state broadcaster RTE over a report that alleged he had received favorable treatment in the sale of a state-owned company, SiteServe, to a consortium led by his firm, Millington. The report claimed that the deal resulted in a loss to the Irish taxpayer of up to 110 million euros. O'Brien denied any impropriety in the deal and argued that the RTE report was defamatory. The case went to court, and in 2018, O'Brien won a significant victory when the Irish High Court ruled that RTE had defamed him in the report. The court awarded him damages of €250,000, although RTE is appealing the decision. Dennis O'Brien successfully obtained a court order preventing the Irish media from reporting on his personal banking affairs. The order was granted by the Irish High Court after O'Brien argued that the publication of details of his personal banking arrangements would be a breach of his privacy. This was a rather strange move, and his part since doing something like this would further pose the question of what he was hiding. Perhaps the most controversial was in 2017, Dennis O'Brien was named in the Paradise Papers, a leak of documents that revealed the use of offshore tax havens by wealthy individuals and corporations to avoid paying taxes. According to the documents, O'Brien had set up a complex network of offshore companies and trusts in several jurisdictions, including Malta, Guernsey, and the Isle of Man. O'Brien denied any wrongdoing and stated that he had fully complied with all tax laws and regulations in the countries where he did business. He also pointed out that the use of offshore structures was a common practice among multinational companies and that he had not benefited personally from any tax avoidance schemes. Enough of Dennis, how about Digicel's controversies? Of course, we already covered a major one earlier, which is their debt. Interestingly, Digicel has faced accusations of using its political influence to secure favorable treatment from governments in the countries where it operates. For example, in 2017, the company was fined $1.5 million by the regulator in Bermuda after it was found to have breached anti-corruption laws. In other countries, Digicel has been accused of having close ties to political leaders, including in Jamaica and Haiti. In some cases, these relationships have been seen as beneficial for the company, helping it to secure favorable treatment from regulators and other government officials. Digicel has denied any wrongdoing and has said that its relationships with political leaders are based on mutual respect and a shared commitment to economic development and growth. To be fair, the company has acknowledged that it needs to be more transparent about its political activities and relationships, and has taken steps to improve its corporate governance and anti-corruption policies in recent years.
In this chapter, we wish to cover some of the challenges, the sad realities that Digicel may face for the foreseeable future, and the positive impact they have had on the region so far. We are living in a society where the controversies of not just companies, but individuals get highlighted more often than the philanthropic work that they have done with communities and nations. Digicel is no different. Digicel's expanding network infrastructures have allowed greater connectivity with nations of the region because now countries are better able to exchange cultural, social, and philosophical ideas. Countries that have common interests and ambitions because of the newfound interconnectivity are better able to work together and share resources and infrastructures. Friends, family, and colleagues can stay connected regardless of their location, and industries were able to forge alliances. This was not the case throughout the 90s, and it felt like the region risked being left behind in the technological advancement the rest of the world was experiencing. Digicel has played a role in this. The healthy competition that they brought to the forefront has forced other telecommunications operators to step their game up, benefiting the customers. Digicel has created thousands of jobs across the region, both directly and indirectly. The company has employed people in a range of roles, from sales and marketing to customer service and technical support. Social media has far more negative influences than positives, but we cannot deny how companies have leveraged it to reach their target niche. Digicel played its part by its providing reliable and affordable mobile services. Digicel has helped to stimulate economic growth and development in the region. The company has supported small businesses and entrepreneurs, enabling them to reach new customers and expand their operations. Digicel has been at the forefront of technological innovation in the region, introducing new products and services that have transformed the way people communicate and do business. In fact, Digicel was the first mobile operator to launch its 4G LTE network in the region in 2012. This technology offered faster mobile data speeds and improved connectivity for its customers. The launch of 4G LTE was a significant milestone for Digicel and helped to position the company as a leader in mobile telecommunications in the Caribbean. Dennis's philanthropic beliefs are transmitted through his businesses, and over the years Digicel has been a leader in corporate philanthropy, supporting a range of social and economic development initiatives across the region. The company has invested in education, healthcare, sports, and the arts, among other areas. Haiti is one of the nations in the Caribbean that is well below poverty levels, and according to a World Bank report in 2021, over half of the Haitian population lives below the national poverty line, and almost a quarter of the population lives in extreme poverty. Digicel was aware of the challenging socioeconomic situation in Haiti, so Digicel has built over 200 schools in Haiti as part of its Digicel Foundation's education program. This program aims to increase access to education for children of Haiti, particularly in the areas that were most affected by the 2010 earthquake. So, it is safe to say overall, Digicel has had a positive impact on the region, helping to bridge the digital divide, create jobs, and promote economic growth and development. But what's next for the organization? The present socio-economic landscape of the world's economy is a very fragile one where we see huge corporate entities in the financial and tech sector collapse in the blink of an eye. So often the trend of modern-day startups is to focus on rapid expansion, where they prioritize the growth of the companies over the profitability of that company, solely relying on investors' funds to keep the companies afloat. This is a form of equity financing, but Digicel was formed over two decades ago with its startup funds mainly from its founder, Dennis. To expand its operations, it had to adapt its strategies to rely mainly on debt financing, and this is where I think Digicel made a mistake. This type of financing involves borrowing a specific amount of money that must be repaid over a set period, typically with interest. Even though this allowed Dennis to maintain control over the company while raising capital, it also comes with the risk of defaulting on the debt if the company cannot repay the borrowed amount in the stipulated period. Which takes me to my next point. If you are not aware of recent events in the news over the past month, with reports indicating that Dennis is set to lose control of 90% of Digicel, According to some of these reports, it is believed that Dennis O'Brien has agreed to deal with debt holders for a debt-for-equity swap deal. 
This would mean that the company's outstanding debt is converted into ownership equity in the company for the debt holders. Some reports are that Dennis will remain on the board as a director, and he will be the single largest individual shareholder in Digicel. It seems the writing was already on the wall for Dennis for a while now. The warning signs were there from the debt restructuring to selling its subsidiary, Digicel Pacific Limited to Telstra in 2022. We will be doing a follow-up video in the future soon, focusing more in-depth on Dennis O'Brien, but what is on the horizon for Digicel is uncertain. If you have made it this far, it means you have truly enjoyed this video. We would like it if you could smash that like and subscribe button if you have not already done so. You can click the notification bell to be updated when we upload new videos. Until then, thank you for watching.